Over 25,000 men have played at least one game in the NFL in its first 100 years in existence. And of all of those, just 304 have ever had the privilege of having their likeness immortalized in bronze and placed in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But how exactly do they get in? Time to sit back for another round of NFL Explained. It's the road to the Hall of Fame. Let's start with the basics. Let's go! First thing any player or coach has to do to qualify for the Hall is be retired. I am officially retiring from the NFL. And stay retired. 10 days ago, I was doing yard work. For five years. And your five years starts back over if you unretire. So, no regrets. Yeah, we're talking to you, Brett Favre. <laughs> Guy loves to play the game. Outside of being out of the game for half a decade, you also have to be named to a first team all pro team. Oh, oh my goodness! Or at least have made a Pro Bowl at some point in your career. Back, back, yeah. get on them. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> and of course, you have to be nominated. We get multiple letters a day, people nominating, and then we we allow our selectors to nominate. So it's a year-round process and we're fielding nominations. Anyone can nominate a player for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. All you have to do is write a letter. You catch that? That means if for some reason everyone had forgotten to nominate Brian Erlacher, Bear Man could have simply sent the Hall an email on his behalf. But what if no one nominates a guy, or they all forget? You don't know who Steve Smith is. By the end of this game, you don't know who he is. Well, it turns out a player can raise his hand on his own behalf, too. There's nothing stopping me from nominating me. Because I love me some me. Believe it. So every year, all the qualified candidates begin the long journey to try to make it to Canton. I'm going to Canton, and you're coming, too. The Hall of Fame Selection Committee, we'll get to them in a second, gets a list, usually between 100 to 130 players long, that they have to evaluate. Well, I feel confident I can play better than anybody that's ever played the position. And eventually pair all the way down to the lucky few who will make it in. Pro Football Hall of Famer, Champ Bailey. But before we explain how they go about doing that, let's stop and talk about who makes up that committee, because they are the ones who either say yay. I'd like to personally thank the 44 men and women that went to a room on February 5th and deemed my play on the field worthy of this prestigious honor. Or nay, to the great dismay of both fans and sometimes the players themselves. They hate to love me! So who exactly was T.O. mad at all those years, you know, before he finally got in? A media person that's regularly covering a National Football League team or the league in general. So you have to be active in the media. There's 48 elite media selectors, and they are the best in their business. Well, generally, we want someone that's, you know, been around and has the wherewithal to make decisions that are as important as this is. Okay, so all of them are media types. 32 of them come specifically from each NFL city, two each from LA and New York, since each of those cities have two teams in the league. Then there are the 16 at-large selectors, also active members of the media. For example, guys like writer Peter King or the NFL Network's Jim Trotter. It's one of the greatest responsibilities to have professionally is, is participating on the committee because what you learn over time is just how much it means to the men uh, who are up for consideration. It's like a dream come true. It's unbelievable. The Hall of Fame itself, by the way, doesn't have anyone on the committee. They only process the nominations for the group. But that's it. It's 48 well-vetted NFL gurus that are not charged just with understanding what makes Drew Brees great compared to the peers of his day. Drew Brees is the NFL's all-time leading passer. Yeah! But they're also responsible with understanding how Breeze measures up to pass grades, who oftentimes can't be measured by the stats Breeze put up. Unitas dropping back, good protection. Unitas sets a new NFL record for TD passes thrown, 213. You have to put things in context. Some players are not going to have the numbers that another player had because maybe he didn't play in a pass-centric offense. Deep ball on a hitch to Irving. Maybe he played in a run-centric offense. He's on his way! Or maybe he played out in the cold of Buffalo in November, December, January. Woo! It's crazy. I can't see nothing. Whereas another player played in a dome, so there's always good weather, or played in California. 
where there's always good weather. On a beautiful day in the Los Angeles area, it's week four. Because if all we're going to look at is statistics, you don't need a Hall of Fame voting committee. You just pick out whoever has the most of any category and you go with that person. I'm a rock star. Some of them tell me that they do like 120 interviews a year to get ready to calibrate excellence and to measure greatness on that day. This is it! Right here, right now! It's our turn! I have been blown away by the fiduciary responsibility that each of our selectors take. Uh, they are responsible people, and they take this duty very seriously. Welcome to the Gold Jacket Contenders. Today, we'll introduce you to the 130 modern era players who have a chance to be part of the Pro Football Hall of Fame class of 2021. Every year by March 1st, those 48 voters get that initial list of 100 plus players sent to them. First ballot's gonna be a real, real uh, interesting discussion for Jim and the other voters. It's made up of strong first time eligible candidates. He is just maybe the finest all around athlete that's playing the game today. Plus any candidate who received a nomination via fans, clubs, their mom, it doesn't matter. Man, my mama probably is going crazy right now. Also included on the list, any modern day nominee from the previous year's list that received at least four votes. Four scores seven years ago, brother. And finally, any player the committee members deem worthy who might have been overlooked. I, I guess he didn't read the scout report. <laughs> What about Calvin Johnson? Because to me, that's going to be a very interesting discussion. And look, there's no question. Calvin Johnson was the most dominant wide receiver, in my opinion, of his ear when you talk about his side, his speed, and his physicality. Megatron got it! But there are some hardliners who do believe that longevity matters. Committee members get an updated list sent to them in July, and then a final version of the list is sent to them in September. And this is where it starts to get good. I like this kind of party, baby! This is the stage where the voting starts. Each committee member has to pick out the best 25 players from the list who will advance to the semifinal round. For me, it's really about the eye test. It's about impact. It's about what guys did in the big games. Riggins. He's going to go all the way. With the big moments. Down the near sideline for Drew Pearson. Pearson makes the catch at the five, touchdown! <laughs> those sorts of things, more so than just statistics. McCown takes the snap. He steps up. Jared Allen got him. 22 sacks, a new Minnesota Vikings record. I want to confirm or affirm my feelings with other people who have played against those players or who have coached those players. And so you start making calls to people just to get their feelings on certain things. Once all their votes are tallied, the top 25 move on. Let's get this show going, man. And no special scoring. Each member's vote counts as one. Then, come November, each voter gets the new slimmed down list. And this time, they vote for their top 15. Where it starts to get more difficult is that after you cut to 25, and let's say you're going to 15, then you're doing a little more homework because to me, the candidacies become more equal. With the list now down to the final 15, it's on to Selection Saturday. The day when the 48 voters finally all come together face to face in the hosting Super Bowl city one day before the big game is played. And we would get there, you know, start arriving by 6.37 or so in the morning and we might be there sometimes nine hours. They all sit down around a horseshoe shaped table to begin the process of deciding who will be immortalized as one of the NFL's all-time greats. And to begin the discussion on Kurt Warner is Bernie Miklas of 101 ESPN. Bernie? A selector, usually from that uh, player city, would stand up and give a seven minute presentation as to why this person deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Multiple Super Bowls is not the template for how we judge Hall of Fame coaches. We judge them by impact. But how much weight do those presentations and debates carry? It's a room full of NFL experts, mind you, so you'd think they'd be hard to sway. But Trotter says the last minute pleas can often make a difference. Yeah, I think presentation matters because you will hear some voters talk about presentations after the fact and say, man, that was really good, made me think. Great, thank you. Unless anybody objects to that, let's go on. Once their presentation is over, the debates begin. Everyone in the room can now chime in, both in support of the player or against him. Some debates are quick. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up! 
this has become a very popular story and we're not allowed to uh, convey or communicate what happens in that room. Uh, Brett Favre's in his first year of eligibility. In 2016, when it was time to discuss the merits of Brett Favre, the selector got up and said Brett Favre and sat down. So that was all the discussion that we had on Brett Favre. And the great players, yeah, you get up and you say, I present Jerry Rice, you sit back down. I've got a presentation here, but um, I think we should just skip it. You know, you have some of those players who are just transcendent players. But just saying someone's name doesn't always work. And then it's discussion. And the discussion can go up to an hour at times on just one guy. And it can take 10 hours, 12 hours uh, uh, on that day. It's no secret that one of the longest discussions were revolved around Paul Tagliabue's candidacy. And there was a lot of emotion at times. And it can get heated. Come on! Come on! Which is why the president is present to keep everyone in line. I don't have a vote, but you gotta gotta be six, eight, 400 pounds to run this meeting because there's a lot of uh, very opinionated, strong-willed guys there. In theory, the debates aren't about a player's personality either or how they carried themselves in interviews after the game. Don't talk to me, all right? Knock it off! I'm just here so I won't get fined. You're basically told that you evaluate someone based on what they did between the white lines. Well, it's written in our bylaws. Our selectors are to consider uh, only what the player has done on the field to be considered for when they're voting. I'm not here to be the moral police for these players and I don't feel comfortable sitting in moral judgment of players. We're evaluating football players in my mind. And so therefore I look at what his impact was on the field. And another touchdown for Jim Brown. However, bylaws are just bylaws and voters, well, they're human. Sometimes we'll even have to remind voters that, hey, this is what you're supposed to be evaluating someone on, not this. Every voter has to do what's in his heart and, and not everyone feels the same way. Owens, of course, the best recent example. Some of my actions have drawn a lot of attention. The whole TO discussion made me uncomfortable that we had gotten into an area where we were not talking about football. We were talking about a lot of other things. If that's one of the criterion that you're going to use, then do you go back retroactively and apply it to some other players who are in the Hall of Fame who may not have been popular with teammates? I want to thank my teammates because they put up with a lot of crap from me. Or may not have been, quote unquote, a good teammate. Another rule the voters are supposed to follow, secrecy. While cameras are allowed to record the presentations, they aren't allowed to do so for the debates. To allow the selectors to be candid. I mean, not everything that they discuss in that room is positives. This ain't gonna be pretty the way we gotta finish this out. And so to allow them the ability to discuss confidentially the merits of whether someone should or should not be elected in the Hall of Fame, that allows them to do that. It is sometimes razor thin in terms of who goes in and who goes out. And, and it is uh, deeply debated. So uh, I think to protect the confidentiality of those that are in there, you don't want it to be taken out of context, uh, but you do want it to be a, a full, open, and complete debate. Many fans though, and even some voters, think the meetings and votes should be public. Make it public, this is not the Pope. We're, we're not going into a secret room. It shouldn't be that way. If you want to have that, if you want to have this privilege, then you should make it public. As journalists, it's kind of hypocritical of us to say we want transparency in our day-to-day -day job, but we don't want to be transparent when it comes to us uh, in this voting process. But he's hesitant to get behind the entire process being televised. I don't, I don't want to turn this into theater. It's too important to the men that we're voting on it. Regardless, once everyone's finally had their say, they sit down and vote, narrowing the list from 15 to their top 10. It gets tough in there because once you get to 15, you know, those are the cream of the crop. And then they vote all over again, having to decide on who the final five are gonna be. It's grueling sometimes to go from 10 to five. You walk out of there and people think you didn't vote for so-and-so and it's not that you didn't vote for them because you don't like them. So you didn't vote for him because you only got five. If you get your feelings hurt, that's too bad. Then, after they've eliminated five players from the list, they have to vote again. But this time, their vote is a yes or no question about the remaining five nominees. Do they belong in the Hall of Fame? To gain enshrinement, the player has to receive 80% of the vote or better. It is 
a difficult choice. They all, I'll tell you, they all understand how difficult it is because everybody second guesses each of our selectors. But you know, it should be hard to get into the Hall of Fame. For goodness sakes, it's the Hall of Fame. <laughs> That's what makes the Pro Football Hall of Fame so special. It's the exclusivity of it. Now, for those who don't hit the 80% mark, there is a silver lining. Every player or coach remains eligible for election for 20 years. <laughs> and even if they don't make it in that two decade window, they get moved to the senior pool. You're too no. You're too old! Uh, a calculation that uh, Joe Horgan and Salim have shared with me is that if you've been a finalist twice, you've got an 82% chance of being in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. See, on top of the 48-member selection committee, there's also a subcommittee, which is made up of nine veteran members of the regular group. A coaches and contributor category, where there's kind of a parallel process going to narrow those down to a finalist in each. How about you, Cowboys? Yeah! Specifically, they're in charge of narrowing down their list of candidates to three, two senior players and one contributor. Those three are added to the mix at the stage where the presentations are made. Johnny Robinson. So in the end, they too have to go through the same process as the modern day nominees, where the room debates them and ultimately votes on them. And they too have to be approved by 80% of the room to get in. But because so few from the senior pool make it in each year, it can often take some time. So there are some players next year that have a tremendous opportunity to go into the Hall of Fame. So if you don't get in this year, you may be waiting a little bit of a time. Former Packers legend Jerry Kramer, for example, made it in in 2019, 50 years after he retired. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I could uh, say thank you for the rest of the evening and not get it done. Once the voting is over and the votes are counted up, which by the way is handled by an accounting firm, the president receives the results and first takes care of the less desirable business, calling the guys who didn't make it. We try very hard to call the guys before we knock on the door so that if anybody's next door to somebody whose door is being knocked upon, they don't hear that guy celebrate. Um, because we, we hate disappointing any of them, but we don't want to disrespect them at all. After that, though, comes the fun. <laughs> and David Baker, who was elected president of the hall in 2014, has made it a point since he took over to make it as much fun as possible by introducing what has become known as the knock. Baker goes door to door at the hotel the nominees stay at to tell them personally Hutch. they made it in. Congratulations, buddy. Welcome to Canton, Ohio, brother. <laughs> Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, man. Yes, sir. We in, buddy. Okay. Well, that's incredible. Okay, now we need you to put some pants on. Okay, yeah. Okay, because you're going to be on national TV tonight, Rob. Okay. Yeah, you are the most beautiful thing I've seen in a long time. When you knock on the door, they're not thinking, how much money did I make? They're not thinking, yeah, about their records or their stats. Uh, they're thinking about their mom that drove them to practice when they were 10 years old, and their dad that encouraged them and wouldn't let them quit, or their coach that inspired them, or their teammates uh, that believed in them. Uh, and, and it hits them all like that. Welcome to Canton, Ohio, brother. <laughs> okay, God bless you, bud. Baker took the premise a step further in 2020, surprising a couple of coaches who were in the middle of doing their jobs. But there's always room for one surprise guest, especially when it's this man coming in right now from the Pro Football Hall of Fame, David Baker, the president. Kurt, good to see you, Kurt. How are you? Good to see you. Kurt, how are you doing, good. sir? Good. It's my great honor to tell you that you're going to be the 328th Hall yes. of Famer. Uh, this is so special to me. Yeah, he is special. And you know, Bill, there's something else special here. Hey, who's this big fella? And I want to welcome you to Canton, Ohio, where your bronze hey, your yeah. legacy. How about that, Bill? Hey, come Congratulations. On in. <laughs> Once all the relevant parties have been notified, the public as well, that Saturday night on NFL Network, the new inductees are announced to the world on NFL Honors.
but for the lucky few, one of the best memories comes on a stage like this one, in front of a live audience like you all. It's that moment when Canton comes calling. And from there, it's time to get ready for the party. Hey, let's party now! Or induction in this case. That means getting fitted for one of those illustrious gold jackets. John Stallworth said that when you put on the gold jackets, it's like wrapping the history of the game around you from the day that they first laced up a pigskin to the last time they presented the Lombardi trophy. They also have to smile big for the camera, or in this case, the bust maker. Well, we have our sculptor, our main sculptor, Blair Buswell, who has a studio in Utah. And he's at the Super Bowl every year having a discussion immediately after the selection meeting occurs with the newly elected members when they start that process. And they talk about, you know, what you want to look like. As far as expression-wise, what are you leaning towards? I'm leaning towards. Happy to be there or want to bite someone's head off? No, happy to be there. Most of them are depicted as they looked when they played. There's a couple that wanted to be depicted as they looked when they were trying, so it's interesting. Woo, that's pretty! Making sure it's perfect is important because making into the hall is as much about making it into this room, the Hall of Legends. This is where NFL immortality is truly achieved. I believe that the busts talk to each other. And I can't wait for that conversation, I really can't. Of the 330 million that have played the game, of the 5 million that have played it in college, of the 27,000 that have ever been paid to play it in the National Football League, well, there's 326 guys as of today who have a bronze bust here. So it's a huge honor. The process ultimately culminates with the grand ceremony held in Canton at the Hall itself on the day before the season's first preseason game, known as the Hall of Fame game. The jacket is placed upon their shoulders and the tears begin to flow. This is tougher than any third and 15, I can assure you. I know it ain't no crying in football. I apologize, I, my, my bad. We're not standing up here because of our own merit or because of something that we've done by ourselves. Football is a team game, and it takes everyone on that team to make a product such as these Hall of Famers that are sitting under this tent and the ones that are being inducted here today. I've had the distinct pleasure of playing on some pretty good football teams. And today, I join the greatest team in them all, the Pro Football Hall of Fame. To be able to join these men on this stage in football heaven is the greatest day of my life.